Raid weapons have been some of the most coveted loot in Destiny since the very beginning back in 2014. These weapons are often some of the most powerful items in the game and can completely change how players approach playing Destiny. A few of these weapons are even so powerful that it's hard to make it into a group if you're missing out on an important one. Some of the most famous raid weapons from the original Vault of Glass have already made their way back into Destiny 2, but we're still missing a few of the epic ones. And as we see more old raids make their way back into Destiny 2, there's a pretty high chance that we'll see some of our favorite weapons making a big return. In this video, we're going to be taking a trip down memory lane and looking at some of the best gear that's ever dropped from the Raids of Destiny. In Season of the Splicer, we received a remastered and revamped version of the Vault of Glass, the original raid that cemented Destiny as a new take on the classic MMO genre. This gave players a taste of the endgame experience that's rarely ever been seen in a shooter game. With the Vault of Glass making its way back into Destiny 2, we also got some of the fan-favorite weapons back in our hands, including the OG God Tier Hand Cannon Fatebringer as well as the raid exotic the Vex Mythoclast. Fatebringer, along with the other legendaries like the Found Verdict and Vision of Confluence, felt pretty true to form from Destiny 1. Vex Mythoclast, on the other hand, had its perk completely changed. It could now be transformed into a linear fusion rifle after just getting a few kills. But there were a few important guns from Destiny history that didn't make it back into the refreshed version of the raid. An auto rifle, the Atheon's Epilogue, a pulse rifle, the Praetor's Timepiece, and a fusion rifle, the Praetorian Foil. Atheon's Epilogue was a 900 RPM auto rifle, which is an archetype that actually doesn't exist right now in Destiny 2. The fastest we have in the current sandbox is 720 RPM. It also came with a perk Perfect Balance, which really helped to control the recoil with that wildly fast rate of fire. There was something so fun and special about this auto rifle. Watching an enemy's health pool steadily melt away was just a great feeling. Praetor's Timepiece was a high rate of fire pulse rifle. In the original Vault of Glass era, these really weren't a great choice, but later on this archetype of pulse rifle became the absolute meta when weapons like the Grasp of Moloch and the Clever Dragon showed up. This was also one of the most rare drops from the hard mode version of the Vault of Glass. The Praetorian Foil was also incredibly rare, but unlike the timepiece, this thing was wildly powerful. Many players never saw this thing drop, and when I first got my hands on it, it instantly became my favorite fusion rifle in the game. It melted Guardians with its high impact damage in PvP, and it could take out an Oracle in the Atheon boss fight in just one charge. If you were lucky enough to get one, it probably never left your character's inventory. In the current meta of Destiny 2, auto rifles, pulse rifles, and fusion rifles are at very different ends of the spectrum. Auto rifles these days don't see nearly as much use as they once did. Comment down below if you played during the gnawing hunger meta. It's a bit difficult to picture the Atheon's epilogue making a big return at the top of the meta without some serious changes. These would also overlap a bit with SMGs which we didn't have back in Destiny 1, so I'm not really sure if we can expect a big comeback for this type of archetype. But who knows, there's a notorious exotic auto rifle coming up later on the list that just screams 900 RPM. On the other side of things, pulse rifles have become quite popular lately, both in the form of the higher impact ones like No Time to Explain, as well as the faster firing options like Peace of Mind. I think Praetor's Timepiece might actually be a really popular choice today. Fusion rifles are continuing to be a really strong choice in both PvE and PvP following their buff in Season 15. If the Praetorian Foil was able to make a return to Destiny 2, it could very well be one of the top fusion rifles in the game, depending on how the higher impact archetypes were performing at the time. Of course, there's one thing that's way more fun than any of the weapons in the Vault of Glass. That would be the incredible jump after the Templar fight. This made my jaw drop the first time I ever experienced it back in 2014. Since we're talking about raid nostalgia, obviously this video has to be sponsored by the most notorious mobile raiding game of all time, Raid Shadow Legends. Their aim is to bring the first truly console level gaming experience over to the convenience of your phone. If you've tried raid before, you'll probably really enjoy the newest addition to the champion roster. That would be Deliana from the High Elves faction. She's one of the strongest support champions in the game, and if you pick her, you're going to be carrying your team past many of Raid's hardest challenges. Raid is currently running a special event where you can try out Deliana for yourself. All you have to do is log in and play Raid for 7 days between now and July 28th, and you'll get Deliana for free. There's some new special bonuses for new players as well. Just enter promo code MYDELIANA and you'll get a bunch of cool bonuses. You can also get some great skins for Trunda the Dwarf during their Summer Splash events. This is an awesome time to get started in Raid, and if you click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on screen, you're going to get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free Epic Champion Aina, 200,000 Silver, 1 Energy Refill, 1 XP Boost, and 1 Ancient Shard so you can summon your awesome champions as soon as you get into the game. All this treasure is going to be waiting for you right here. Thanks to Raid for sponsoring, and let's get back into the next Destiny Raid. In late 2014, Bungie released Crota's End, the first hive theme raid set deep within the moon. This was a challenging day one raid, almost exclusively because of the light level difference between the content and what was possible to be achieved by the players before beating the raid and getting that final drop from Crota. Nowadays, Crota's End is little more than a joke. 
The encounters were fairly easy and simplistic, and many of them were able to be cheesed in various ways. It got to the point where it became pretty common to solo the entire raid in less than half an hour. Most players don't want their raid experience to be this easy, and there's been some suggestions that maybe this raid could come back as a 3-player dungeon with some changes to the current mechanics. One way or another, I'm hoping to see this get remastered and brought back into Destiny 2 at some point, mostly so we can get one particular weapon back in our hands. We already have Whisper of the Worm, which was an exotic reissue of the legendary Black Hammer Sniper from Destiny 1. This legendary sniper was later converted into the exotic sniper called the Black Spindle. The original Black Hammer generated special ammo and reloaded the magazine just by landing three consecutive critical hits, and it became a near-mandatory tool to clear endgame content because of the effectively infinite ammo. Eventually, it got nerfed to only consume ammo from your reserves instead of generating ammo, which still made it a solid DPS dealing sniper but not quite as good for cheesing content. When Whisper of the Worm was introduced into Destiny 2, it was initially just as crazy as the Black Hammer, and once again it generated its own ammo after you landed three consecutive crits. But time seemed to repeat itself, and now the Whisper only consumes ammo from reserves yet again, just like the nerfed version from Destiny 1. Regardless, Black Hammer will be remembered as one of the best PvE weapons in Destiny history, along with the Yallerhorn from early Destiny 1. Crota's End, though, featured a rocket launcher of its own that actually rivaled the mighty Yallerhorn and became a good substitution if you wanted to use an exotic primary or a special weapon. The Hunger of Crota was a legendary rocket launcher. This was guaranteed to drop with intrinsic tracking and cluster bombs. It also had a two rocket magazine, which helped to cut down on the lengthy reload times that pained most of the other legendary rocket launchers. Destiny 2 doesn't let legendary rockets roll with two rockets in the magazine anymore as an intrinsic perk. Instead, players have to rely on perks like Ambitious Assassin, which gives two rockets in the magazine on reload after killing multiple targets, or Overflow, which reloads the magazine to double its size after picking up either heavy or special ammo. In fact, the only rocket in the game that inherently has two rockets in the mag anymore is none other than the Ellerhorn. Hunger of Crota would be instantly one of the best in slot rockets if it could hold two rockets in the magazine in today's game, but I don't really see that happening. More likely, it would either have Ambitious Assassin or Overflow in its perk pool, which would help it keep in line with the other desirable legendary rockets that we have today. Crota's End featured a few other weapons that were decent choices because they dealt elemental damage, which was very rare on primary weapons, but otherwise they weren't all that special. The Word of Crota was a high rate of fire hand cannon that fired void bullets which was very useful for breaking void shields. It also had an early version of the triple tap perk that we know today called Phantom Gift. Abyss Defiant was a solar auto rifle with the unique perk Lich Bane which disrupted those annoying hive wizards. Oversoul Edict was a high rate of fire pulse rifle similar to the Praetis Timepiece, which was a pretty lackluster archetype in early Destiny, but it did feature the perk Darkbreaker which could make bullets penetrate through those frustrating hive knight shields. But maybe the most interesting weapon to come from Crota's End was the one that I'd most want to try in Destiny 2, the Necrochasm. This was an exotic 900 RPM auto rifle that required you to earn a rare item, the crux of Crota, to obtain it alongside a lengthy quest involving weaker versions of the final auto rifle. Necrochasm took all that explodey goodness from the Cursed Thralls and packaged it into an auto rifle. All you needed was to land a headshot kill and everything around the enemy would go boom. Unfortunately, it was never the most powerful primary or really anything close to it, but seeing those explosions work like a twist in the classic Firefly perk was just so cool, and the gun looked awesome. Similar to the Atheon's epilogue, I'm not sure exactly how this archetype would fit into the game today, because it would definitely have a lot of overlap with SMGs, but if they ever did decide to bring it back, I'd be thrilled to give this thing a try in Destiny 2. In September of 2015, Bungie released King's Fall as the raid to accompany the Taken King expansion, arguably the best expansion in Destiny history depending on who you ask. This was a major time of change in the Destiny ecosystem, with big improvements to core systems in the game including the ability to infuse items to level them up, a deep rebalancing of weapons in PvP, three new subclasses, an excellent new campaign featuring a new destination on the Dreadnought, and to top it off, an epic raid that many Destiny fans will have towards the top of their favorites list. The final boss fight with Oryx is something that stuck with many players, and new raids are still being compared to the standard that the King's Fall raid set. It had great challenging encounters with a huge payoff at the end which made for an experience that players aren't likely to forget quickly. It was certainly an improvement over Crota's End and it proved that Bungie could make challenging raids with fun engaging mechanics for the more hardcore players out there. Unfortunately, having well designed encounters doesn't mean that the loot was also well received. Most of the King's Fall weapons were outclassed by loot from other sources with a few exceptions. Quillum's Terminus, a legendary machine gun, was perhaps the most popular gun that could drop from the raid. It was a decent heavy choice throughout most of Destiny 1's life cycle, including during the Age of Triumph. It had access to perks like Cocoon, which was an early version of auto-loading holster, and Life Leech, which gave health back after rapid kills. This provided usability that other machine guns didn't have, and the ability to roll Persistence and Extended Mag meant that you could go on a very long time before you had to reload. 
If this machine gun was to make a return back to Destiny 2, I don't really think it would make much of a splash since the perks available are pretty commonplace these days. I will give it credit though for the unique aesthetics. Many of the other King's Fall weapons didn't feel much better than the other non-raid loot available at the time. And to make things worse, the primary weapons from King's Fall lacked the elemental damage that made other primaries from the Vault of Glass and Crotus End so special. Outside of Year 1 Adept Trials loot and the Prison of Elders guns, there was no other way to earn primary weapons that had elemental damage types. So missing out on the elemental burn on the King's Fall weapons felt like a big hit to the relative power of the raid loot. Although much of the loot was definitely lackluster, I did love the sniper from the raid for PvP. Defiance of Yasmin had a really unique scope and tons of aim assist. It practically gave you free headshots and it quickly became a favorite sniper among the Crucible enthusiasts. While the legendary weapons were not the most exciting loot compared to previous raids, there was one particular gun that will forever be infamous in Destiny for making the orcs encounter much easier and dealing a ton of damage at the cost of your own health pool. Touch of Malice was a rapid fire scout rifle that had the unique function of never running out of ammo. Instead, when the user got down to their last bullet, the gun would instead take a little bit of health and then refill the magazine with a single high damage bullet. This would repeat until the player reloaded or they died from pushing the perk a bit too far. In PvP, this was a big trade-off and the danger of low health usually wasn't worth that extra damage. But in PvE, and especially during the Oryx fight at the end of King's Fall, a Titan Bubble could provide an overshield and negate most of the danger from eating away at your own health pool. Players would simply dip in and out of the bubble to refresh their shield while dishing out incredible DPS for a primary weapon. I think Touch of Malice could mostly come back in its original form and it would be a lot of fun to use in Destiny 2. With the numerous sources of healing we have access to these days, especially after the Solar 3.0 update, I think it could be a very popular weapon for endgame PvE activities once again. You might say that we've saved the best loot for last. In September of 2016, Bungie released the Wrath of the Machine Raid to accompany the Rise of Iron expansion. I'll go ahead and say it, the mechanics in the Wrath of the Machine Raid are unparalleled to any other raid in Destiny 1, including King's Fall. This is my favorite of the Destiny 1 raids, save maybe for the Vault of Glass, and that one really benefits from a huge dose of nostalgia since it was the first ever raid. The atmosphere of Wrath is just fantastic, and the encounters that take place are equally unique and enjoyable. In particular, the entry into the dark rooms leading into the final boss fight is a gaming experience that I'll probably never forget. Alongside the ambiance of the raid, the loot you could receive from completing the encounters was some of the best in the game. This raid provided some of my favorite weapons in the series. The weapons that could drop from this raid are interesting for a few different reasons. They came equipped with some really unique and powerful perk combinations, and they made up for some of the more underrepresented archetypes of the time. For starters, we have the Ex Machina Sniper Rifle. This was a high impact sniper which wasn't particularly common at the time. It came with a top tier perk combination of Spray and Prey and Wait For It. This made it an instantly popular pick for PvE. The combination had some great synergy as it played off of emptying the magazine. Spray and Prey would increase the reload speed of the weapon when the magazine was completely empty, and Wait For It would increase the magazine size after finishing that empty reload. Combined, this would mean that you could put out a lot of damage really really fast. This sniper was outclassed by a few other picks for PvP, but it was considered a best-in-slot option for most of Year 3 in PvE. The If Materia Machine Gun and Chaos Dogma Scout Rifle both featured a synergistic perk combination that made them instant fan favorites as well. Both of these guns came with the perk Triple Double, which had a unique ability to buff another perk, Triple Tap. Triple Double made it so that Triple Tap would return two bullets from reserves to the magazine after hitting three headshots in a row. Theoretically, that meant that you could go on a very long time without reloading, which essentially mitigated the slow reload time on the weapons. This propelled both of these weapons from being just decent legendary raid weapons to the forefront of players' inventories. Alongside these S-tier legendary options, the raid also featured a lengthy exotic quest to get the Pulse Outbreak Prime. This was the predecessor of the gun Destiny 2 players know today, Outbreak Perfected. Outbreak was only obtainable by completing an infamously long quest that took you into the secret parts of the raid accessed by completing a puzzle and then eventually testing your knowledge of the binary number system. If you haven't seen the quest needed to earn this gun, it's worth breaking out some popcorn and watching an old data video just to understand the complexity of what Bungie set the player base onto. Aside from the amazing aesthetic, Outbreak was a very powerful weapon in both PvP and PvE. It generated SIVA nanite bugs by landing precision hits or kills that would go attack enemies. The visuals of this effect were awesome and it really helped to take down big groups of enemies. Outbreak would return in Destiny 2 during the season of the Drifter during the Zero Hour Secret mission. Unfortunately, this mission is now sunset with the launch of Beyond Light, but hopefully we'll see it return before too long. The gun was pretty much unchanged during its transition into the Destiny 2 form and it still remains a go-to option in both PvE and PvP, even being used as a popular DPS option in a few raids. I'm really curious to hear from you, what was your favorite piece of raid loot in Destiny history? Let me know in the comments and also let me know if you think I missed anything important on the list. If you like this video and you want to see more like it, consider hitting the subscribe button. It's free to do and you can always change your mind later.
If you want to see another video like this one, check out my video on Destiny 1's best Iron Banner loot. It's the one on the top right of your screen and also linked in the description.